G'day and welcome to David Joshua Ford, live episode 38. I think I didn't update that title there. <laughs> well, last week was routers. Um, this week we're doing the Canon um, R5C. I've got two bodies here and I'm going to go through just my workflow that I've adapted. Because um, if, if we back up to uh, the origin story, if we go back to like 2005 when I started shooting with Canon gear, um, we had um, the RF, sorry, the EF lenses, and this is, I think, probably one of one of the first lenses that I bought. Um, and this is a 24 to 70 2.8, and it it still works and still it's still good except for the manual ring on it. Um, let me see down here is a bit soft, so let me just make a little room here. So. When I, you can see here, when I turn this, some of the, just achieving manual focus there can be a little bit soft. Um, but otherwise, the elements of the glass were fine. Um, even the, the wobble of the barrel didn't matter too much, you know, and I've had that for um, probably 13 years now. So um, I was designing a uh, workflow because I do both photography and uh, video. So I wanted to get lenses that would kind of cover my bases for the majority of work that I do. And then if we need to rent extra cameras or rent extra lenses, then we could go out and do that. Um, but for my sort of day-to-day -day stuff, bread and butter, this was the EF system. Um, and then about two years ago, I hit a problem, which was that because this lens had its manual focus ring um, getting soft. I sent it into Canon for repair um, under the CP whatever. Um, and then they wrote me back saying, um, we'd be happy to dispose of this lens for you. And I'm like, it's still a good lens other than this little ring just needs like a little something in the, there needs a bit tightening. But basically this lens was end of life and I've had it for, yeah, 13 years. And so that got me a little, they're worried about like how I was going to transition to the newer lenses that are coming out because the RF lenses, if you're not familiar with them, are a whole different mount. Um, essentially, because in a in the DSLR cameras they had the mirror in front of the lens, um, so that was a you know mirrored camera. Now that we're going to mirrorless, they've taken out that mirror. The EVF is uh, just electronic, so it's something that's based off the sensor, and there's more space there that they can used to not take up as much space on the sensor side and the lenses can sit a bit closer to the camera. Um, so that means that the the newer, um, what I'm saying, the, the EF glass will mount to the newer camera bodies, the RF bodies, but my older bodies like the C200 and the 5D Mark IV, they wouldn't mount to any new glass that I bought. So it meant that if I wanted to just replace this lens um, with the RF version. It I didn't. It wasn't like a. It just couldn't like evolve over time. I needed to transition, um, and so around about the end of last year, that's where I, I went all in on the RF um, systems. And so now I've got two of these bodies here. I've got uh, basically two Canon R5Cs, which I shoot for photo and video, and I've got one rigged here for a uh, sort of a camera audio unit. And then I've got a second one, which is a bit more rigged for um, B-roll shooting with a monitor, and we can go over that. Um, but uh, let's just see who's here. We've got um, audio is doubled. Hmm, why would that be? And delayed by a sec. It's me. Oh, Eric, you've got your audio is doubled. Okay. Good, that wasn't, I'm like, I don't see why I would have doubled audio um, over here. Um, but glad to hear that you can hear me and there may be a slight lip sync I might need to change, but uh, if we can live with that. Dispose of this lens, yeah. Dispose of this lens, not bloody likely. Um, bloody is very Australian. Um, so good to see um, Rob here and um, Eric saying hi to each other, and g'day Roto, glad that you could join at this uh, very early hour. Um, I got your questions there, we can, we can go over that. Um, cool. So, um, if you have any other questions as we go along, drop them in the chat, um, and be good to um, hear from you if you have any, you wanna know like 
why I've chosen this or any more details as we go into the unit. Um, we're going to look at, um, I'm going to show you some photos of the last couple of months of how I've been using this on different shoots. This week was a, a good example of that. Um, and then we're going to look at the, um, the audio side things, the battery, uh, we've got a gimbal, and then we'll look at um, traveling because that's a big part of why I've got these bodies as opposed to big, bigger bodies. And then we can also look at uh, photography because that's the other side of these cameras is that I, a lot of what I shoot is um, photography as well. So now I have um, matching uh, 45 megapixel still photo cameras as well as matching um, video cameras. So um, let's, to start off with, let's take a look at the RF ecosystem in 2023 and I will make this full screen here. So part of what I was looking for is an, an ecosystem, something that would, um, sorry, it's got to pause. My slideshow is jumping ahead. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, something that would work for both photo and video um, and also like professionally and personally. I wanted to be able to, for my professional work, I've now got some really great lenses and that kind of stuff. Um, and so to be able to use that in my personal life and just personal photography. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with the quality of the stuff that I've got now. Um, and we'll go over some of that stuff. But um, so for example, here we go. I oh, no, that's the wrong one. Let's go this one. That's better. <laughs> All right. Um, this is my niece. Uh, was visiting over Thanksgiving last year and we went to Central Park. And so it was just really nice to be able to go here's a $7,000 camera, um, go take some nice pictures. And they really enjoyed just sort of playing around with that and um, they didn't drop it, so that was good. Um, but you know, you've got um, nice camera gear, it made to be used, and um, so they, you know, this photo's out of whack, I don't know why it's like that. Um, I'm trying to get rid of this thing here. Let me just see if I can go back full screen. And, Okay, that might be down there. All right, so yeah, we we're in Central Park. They had a great time photographing swans and geese, sorry. Um, so the other reason I wanted to get the Canon R5C is it accepts this um, 2.8, uh, what's that, 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye. So I want to uh, spend some more time experimenting with virtual reality and 3D and that kind of stuff. So. Um, this is an RF lens, needs to go onto an RF body. I couldn't buy this lens and put it on my C200. Um, you need the 8K resolution to be able to do this. So I haven't been able to fully test out this lens, but um, this is part of my ecosystem of having a camera that will accept that so that I can do this kind of work as well. There's another picture there. Um, this was around about Black Friday, it had a whole bunch of stuff that came in. And so I'll show you through some of the stuff here because um, yeah, it was a bit ridiculous of all the boxes that came in. The, I uh, just want to show you this mount here. This is just a small rig um, mount, which enables you to lift the camera up and down. So for example, if you're trying to put it into a teleprompter, I'm actually speaking to you through this teleprompter, but it has the Canon PTZ camera in it. Um, but when I do teleprompter work, that's where I use this kind of rig to um, just get the lens where I need to in the middle of the uh, glass. This was a shoot we did at Google recently with a GVM slider, which I need to do a video on, uh, which is in the works. We're, this was the, the B camera. So um, we had A camera front on, and then the B camera was on a sort of 45 degree angle, just going back and forth. Um, and that worked well. It's nice having a, a lighter camera set up with this kind of thing, because this is like a single tripod with some support arms, and um, that, that worked really well. Okay, so now we're in the Hamptons. Um, just wanted to show you that this camera can get wet. There's a bit of uh, water there, like I wouldn't put it in the rain, but um, you know, it was sort of misting and raining. And um, the one thing I wasn't sure about when I first got the R5C is because it's got vents, I was like, is the water going to get in there? But my understanding is that it's just a, a separated vent. So there's like a, a heat sink basically on the back and the um, the air and if there is water, I guess would, would pass through there. It's not going to go like into a, a fan inside of the camera. So um, Know that it's not going to get like drenched um, 
again, personal photo, just out in the Hamptons, um, being able to like just have a really nice camera to take some photos that handle the dynamic range and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> when I was in the Hamptons, I did a live stream on, if you look back a couple of weeks, basically this was the rig, you know, I had a laptop, the other box, a battery, a couple of cables, microphone, my earpiece, and uh, the camera, and then this um, uh, Peak Design tripod, which is super lightweight, fits in the, my, the side of my backpack, and that just enables me to live stream and travel and use a really nice lens on the camera. Um, I do use HDMI out of this camera with like a micro um, thing. That's probably one of the main downsides of the R5C. <clears throat> um, one thing I didn't love is that I, I've got this like mark on this camera. Which one is it? Here it is. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is, but um, it's not a, it's not the body that scratches some like, I think it's like paint and I just can't seem to get it off. So I feel like these bodies are maybe a little more plasticky or something and they, they sort of fudge up um, a little bit. So just something to be aware of in terms of build quality. I haven't had any problems with the build quality yet and maybe some of the rubber is kind of coming up a little bit. Um, and I don't think I wear these cameras like particularly hard, um, but yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And what do we got here? So this is my um, run and gun setup, um, similar to this one. So this is what I would have here. I have showed this Tascam piece and I'll go into this in more detail in a little bit. Um, I have some reservations about this Tascam unit and we can play some audio. Um, but essentially, like one of the main downsides is you can't have a, a top handle on it. Um, because that's sitting into the hot shoe, but that's my rig here. So I've got the battery on the side, which I can actually use as a bit of a handle for stability. And then that will go, I've got a, a very like six inch cord for power. I've got my um, time code in, which is amazing that this like photo camera has a video time code in. I've got a daily uh, time code unit. I've got three of these so I can put on to my other cameras as well down here. Um, and then I've got a wireless pack similar to what I'm using here is a Sennheiser G4. I'm going into a different unit here and a um, Senken, no, something. Yeah, a Senken uh, microphone here for that. So it's my kind of like if I just need to run a gun and or do like an interview on the spot and I'll show you some of those setups in a little bit. Um, that's kind of another view of that and how you would access it. What something that's funny about the Tascam unit is like you uh, you just you plug it on and there's no there's no visual feedback within the camera menu other than like the audio meters and then listening to it and you know so all of the dials are manual which is it's nice having manual dials on sorry you can't see that where are we there we go um, it's nice having manual dials on this but it's it's kind of weird that once you go into the camera menu it, it doesn't I wish there was some sort of confidence feedback to show you that the unit is connected, it's connected properly, assigning channels. So you've got channels one and two that are coming from the task cam and then three and four are coming from the internal microphone, but you can't change those or set those or anything like that. So it's kind of just one and two are your manual lines in and then three and four are just kind of scratch audio. Um, or you probably plug in that, um, the mic port on the side of the camera, but I haven't done that. <clears throat> um, cool. Okay, so this is getting into some of my travel kit, minus my, my clothes would go on top of the gimbal there when I was traveling last week. And then some Aperture uh, 60Xs for lighting and I had a tripod under there and boom. Um, I've shown these Pelican cases in the past 16, 15 airs. I love these for traveling because they are the perfect size for that. So um, <clears throat> if I come to here, um, so this week was a really great example of um, a, a hybrid workflow. So on Monday, I had to fly to Atlanta. On Tuesday, I had a, a like a brand video shoot with like, so it's two video cameras and gimbal and audio and um, a drone, that kind of stuff. Uh, flew back Tuesday. On Wednesday, I had a an sort of like on the spot type interview for another project that I've got going on with like a long-term time-lapse um, and then I shot some headshots in here, 
in the studio. And then yesterday I drove out to like Pennsylvania for some um, like corporate headshots. And so there was like re-rigging everything and taking a different bag to uh, Pennsylvania for some photography. So I was, you know, I've got different bags and different um, things for that. This is my essentially my airline travel. So the two on the right side here, where are we? Okay. On the right side, that's my, my carry-on uh, is the, the backpack and the Manfrotto spinner. And then I've got my two check-in bags, which are um, really great. Um, because they're fairly lightweight for a Pelican case and I've been able to get them to the 50 pound limit. And like that one on the right there is probably about 52 pounds, I think, um, with all the stuff in it. And um, it's within the regular check-in size. So you don't have to worry about doing oversized uh, luggage. This was my solution for, because um, I was flying down on my own, I was carrying gear. So I have two Pelicans and then the, the Manfrotto case is the one, and I'll show you that a bit in a, when we get to the travel section. Um, that's where I put all my lenses in. So that's all the, the expensive stuff that I'm gonna bring onto the airplane. Um, but when I've got two other rollers, I needed a way to latch that on. So I just have some, uh, I don't know, in Australia we'd call them Oki straps, some sort of stretchy thing. Um, <laughs> here that uh, worked really well and it actually balanced it out very well sort of on the fulcrum of, of the wheel there. Um, this is me in taxi. Okay, so get to Atlanta and it's nice having, you know, a camera where I can just grab that and walk around downtown and just, you know, I just did a bit of touristy stuff because I had a couple of hours in the afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to you know, go see around because I hadn't been to Atlanta before and had a quick look around. All right, this is another shoot, um, similar sort of packing, like clothes in the bag um, and uh, same one there. And then that's all the luggage ready to go. And you can see down here, I've got that tripod um, in the side of the back. So for a two camera shoot, I've got my main tripod, which is for the A cam. And then the B cam is like this really lightweight one because I'm just kind of locked off on that. I'm not really moving that around. Um, this is one of the setups I did. So we've got an iDirect over in the back corner here and I've got my um, 60X sort of, I'm using that whiteboard as a big fill. So I'm like bouncing onto it to um, bring that back for a big, nice big fill surface. Uh, the other aperture light over here is being used more as a background light. And then the window that is, you can't see out of sight was sort of, um, providing the backlight for sort of hair light. And this was a two camera setup here where I had uh, this eye direct on the A cam, so they're looking directly at the camera. And then the uh, B cam was sitting on that, that sort of travel tripod. And then I've got my um, Sennheiser 416 shotgun here going directly into, it seems like I had a two short cable here, into the TAS cam. It's a good for illustration, but normally I'd have a longer cable than that. Um, straight in there, uh, just, to keep it simple with a you know smaller shoot where we didn't have like a dedicated audio operator. And then this is the wireless pack that's sitting over here. Close up on the B cam, um, I think we had a 50. So I've got a 50 mil prime on there with a, a, a VND to sort of stop it down. Um, that's one of the main things about, so there are adapters that you can get for the um, uh, EF to RF lenses that adapters, which will have a drop-in filter. So you can actually put a filter in between the lens and the camera. Um, I've got one of those, which I use on my 35 EF. Um, and that, that's really nice being able to fit that in there. Um, but most of this RF stuff is gonna be the traditional way of like screwing something on the front because you can't fit it in between there when there's no adapter. Okay, moving through here. This is like my, my bare bones, you know, if I just need to get a couple of B-roll shots, um, or if I really need to get a couple of B-roll shots, I will just use the internal battery. Um, but the internal battery, you're probably good for like five to 15 minutes of recording. So it's really, it's really not designed for video in terms of the power that you would get out of the internal LP6NH whatever battery. Um, so that's where I have this cage, and we can go into that in a sec. Um, in the, uh, and these uh, V-mount batteries um, to power it. And then off this, 
I don't have to think about it. So with a big media card in there and a big battery, um, that's pretty much it. So, you know, in terms of like a video camera, I don't have to worry about like changing batteries all the time. I just put that's the one battery and it'll probably, it'll do me for the whole day unless I'm running a whole bunch of additional wireless or monitors and that kind of stuff. And then maybe I'd get probably three quarters of a day out of it. So it's, it's pretty, pretty solid. All right. Okay, here's another example of um, the iDirect. If you haven't seen those before, it's essentially like a teleprompter on the side. So I'm looking into a mirror and then it is going, um, the mirror is reflecting onto a 70-30 beam split glass so that the subject is seeing my eyes, kind of like looking through a rear view mirror of a car. And um, behind that is the lens. So it looks like they're looking directly at the lens, even though in reality, they're just having a conversation with me. Um, so there's something where I'm sitting behind the camera and um, sort of directing the interview and also keeping an eye on just the shot and the audio. Um, I've, you can see I've got the, the deity time code here. So I'm syncing this with the B camera, which is around the corner out of shot. I've got the wireless mic here feeding into the Tascam unit and I've got this 416 shotgun with a longer cable going into here. Now I did have audio problems with this, uh, with the beat, with the second channel on this, which I'll, I'll play some audio in a bit. Um, but, and so I'm not sure about this task game unit. I, yeah, I wanna do some more testing. Might have to send it back to them, um, but we'll get to that in a sec. Here's another shot. So in terms of the, the makeup of this shot, I'm essentially using, it's it's kind of split lighting. So I've got the, the light coming from the window um, close to us. And then the windows behind as well are providing sort of a backlight. So there's a sort of darker side on this side. And then I'm just using the Aperture um, 60X with a softbox on it just to, um, give it a bit of pop and also a bit more warmth because there's a lot of daylight and skylight coming through there. So it's a little more bluish in its tone. So I just wanted to give a little more warmth to the front. And then in the back, I've got a second 60X, which is sort of, it's so much of a hair light, more of a rim light. And it's, this is very, very soft. It's like, it's like barely on. Um, just wanted to keep it sort of looking fairly natural. Um, and then here, I've, you can't see it, but I've got a, 50 mil prime on that. And on the B camera, I've got an 85 prime, which I can show you in a bit um, as part of that, those packages that came up. Um, again, we've got the uh, battery here that is just running me the whole day. <clears throat> um, and what else? That's probably about it to say from this picture. And then I, I think what's, what I like about this rig and the way that I've always tried to do my rigs is keeping the back end of the camera free so that the screen can uh, flip out or you can close it entirely or you can turn it and push it back. Um, just because the, the the ability to touch the screen and set the focus um, and sort of track eye focus is, is really important. And that's kind of the way I do interviews, which is um, if I'm running it on like a 1.2 f-stop, then um, the auto focus does a really great job of just tracking the eyes and any sort of forward and backward movement, it'll it'll keep that in focus. So haven't had a problem with any sort of interview setup where someone's sitting and chatting. Um, it doesn't doesn't miss a beat, you know. Um, here's another view of uh, looking into here. So this is what I'm seeing in that mirror, and then that's what the camera's seeing down here for the eye direct. Okay, so once I did that shoot, then I came back to New York and I've got a long-term time-lapse that I'm working on. So on Wednesday, I um, had to go up and do a sort of on-the-spot interview to talk about the um, construction time-lapse that's been, um, been going on. And so again, this is where into my backpack I can fit, um, you know, I can just sort of carry it with me. I'm not having to do a huge amount of equipment um, for just like a small interview. <clears throat> Give me a sec, just gotta like have a sip. All right. Um, yeah, <clears throat> this is the GoPro that I have rigged there. I was in the process of re-rigging it because they'd finished some of the paneling, so I had to actually move it. So um, in the, the three and a half months that it's been running, it's only been moved once, which is when they had to do the, the paneling. I actually flipped it upside down. But essentially, they've built me a platform and I've got a, a clamp and a Manfrotto head. 
and then I've got a, I think it's a small rig plate. <clears throat> yeah, it's a Manfrotto plate and then a, a small rig GoPro mount. And the point is that I can, if I need to, I can take off the camera and then when I click it back in, it's gonna be exactly in the same spot. So it hasn't shifted over that period of time. <clears throat> and then this is a um, uh, battery, which is always on. Um, so that's the kind of power bank that's powering it as well. There's a rear view looking back on the construction. All right, and then we get into photography, which is doing some headshots. And this is kind of a setup where I've got like a Godox 600 um, flash here as the key and a bit of bounce to give it just a bit more feel and lift. Um, this was an example of that. They had a TV in the room, so I just sort of connected that in so I could be um, sort of bringing that up tethered and um, comparing it as we go along. Um, so I'll have my, <coughs> losing my voice guys. Um, let me see another sip here. <coughs> All right, so there we go. Um, okay, so I've got my camera tethered here going into the laptop and that's shooting straight to Capture One so that I can see what we're shooting as we go so we can compare them and try and get a sort of really nuanced shot. And that was the kind of um, the, the end sort of product there. All right, well, what do we got here? Let's go back to my camera here. Um, let's take a little look at some questions. See how we're doing in the chat. Um, Eric says uh, 7K, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, so the Canon R5C is about four and a half. And the lens, I think, is about two, four. Uh, or it might have been a primer, I can't remember what they're using. Yeah, Lewis, good to have you here. I'm not sure why your photo doesn't show up. <clears throat> um, and what else we got? So I've got to come back through these. Um, Questions Eric loves a good architecture shot. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of questions. Errol Morris in Terratron <clears throat> teleprompter. Yeah, it's basically an Terratron. Um, or as my wife says, the, the pterodactyl, because she doesn't know what it is. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so. If you've seen on Netflix, there's a documentary called Stutz um, with Jonah Hill talking to his therapist and they basically use an Interotron, which traditionally is two cameras with two auto cues on them, um, sort of facing each other and then the person sitting there. So rather than um, sitting directly opposite someone having a conversation, you're speaking to the camera with the person's face in the lens. And that means that, which is what I have now basically, which is I've put a PTZ camera into a teleprompter so that I can make sure I'm sending you the right picture and um, looks like I'm looking at the lens, whereas I'm look, actually looking at a picture of myself in the screen. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna jump back to the top here and we can take a look at some of these questions. Um, Roto, you said, uh, good morning from Melbourne. Can't wait to hear what lenses you have. I have Trinity RF, uh, yep, you got all those ones and, and very expensive glass bulky but with every penny future proof and high end glass that's um that's part of why I'm making this transition is you know because it, it is expensive um so for example I've got um bring these ones out so I've the lenses that I have on here <clears throat> let me just hide that one so on this camera I'm right rocking the 24 to 70 EF, uh, sorry, RF, and then this one is the 15 to 35. And then I've got the 70 to 200 in the new RF one. Um, I'll probably keep the EF version just as a, as a backup um, if I need to run two of them. Um, I've got an 85 Prime um, in the RF. And then oh, a couple more here. And then we've got the uh, what's this one? The 50 mil prime. Um, that's one of my favorite. <clears throat> Bring that one up. And then I've got a 35 um, in the EF, which uh, this used to be my favorite lens 
Probably still is. I, I really like that sort of slightly wider look and you're working closer with people, but you've still got like a 1.4 aperture. Um, and this is the one which I was saying with the um, drop-in filter. So if I come down here, um, this is where I could separate that. So this is the EF lens. And then this is a, let's put that one there. Move this camera out. Um, so this has a drop-in filter. This is a Kalari VND 2 to 10. Um, so I can actually just pop that one out like that. And it will go, you know, you can see straight through. So when you have something with a drop-in filter, there'll be a clear one as well, um, which I can pull this from my case. So where is it? Not that one. Give me a second. It's upside down. All right, so here you'll have the case and <clears throat> you can't use it empty because um, this gap is here and I think also it changes the focus slightly. Um, and so you will um, slide a clear one in if you're not wanting any sort of polarization or um, VND on that. Um, just to pull this clear one out, I'll show you the, this one, okay. Um, so if I drop in the, the VND again, like that. And let me see if this will translate. I think, yeah, you should be able to see as I rotate, I'm, I'm shooting under black, so it's probably not the best illustration, but essentially that is very dark to lighter. And so it's really nice to be able to just sort of adjust your, um, your ND internally, which is what a video camera does, doesn't it? So um, anyway, but that one normally lives on the 35 mil lens, because that's the last lens that I have that they don't have in a, that Canon doesn't have in an RF yet. But still great lens. Um, which is an interesting point too, from uh, the point of view that when I was looking at buying the 85 Prime, so this EF, sorry, there, there is an EF 85, which I was like on the fence about buying for a long time. And I didn't for like two years because they brought out the RF mount. And then that was like for two years, I was like, uh, should I, should I, or should I not? So this live stream is about like, yes, I did. I bought all these um, RF lenses and I've sort of moved over that way. Um, but still it was like for a prime, there's something really nice about having a prime with a um, filter on the back of it. And so that works well for my 35. And I was considering getting the, the EF 1.4 version of it because then I'd sort of have a 35 and an 85, which is sort of like wide and tight. And that might be a nice little sort of EF holdover. Um, but in the end, I figured that this was like a, this is like a 10 year investment, right? So this isn't just like, oh, this will be good next year. It's like, even when the R5Cs are superseded with something else, maybe in, I'm guessing four years or something, seems to be the upgrade cycle for me. Um, that these lenses is are something that I will carry through. And so that's where, because this RF version was another, probably like another thousand dollars. It's probably about, around about two and a half, I think two, six. Um, and although I was able to get some sort of um, holiday deals on it and Peibu has a good deal with the B&H. And so I was able to get it probably more for like two, four, I think with some of the credit card details that B&H has. Um, or two, three, I think even. Yeah. Anyway, but I, I decided that like, not even just for the next couple of years, but for like 10 years from now, I'm still gonna have this lens. Um, unless of course it becomes like this old boy here where uh, Canon goes, no, we can't, we can't fix, we can't fix it. End of life, done. Um, so that's kind of the lineup of uh, lenses that I've got. So that gives me um, the Holy Trinity, like you said, Roto, um, which does a lot of the stuff. The, the image stabilization in that is great because for video, that's um, like, it makes a huge difference if you're trying to get a bit of B-roll quickly. Um, the, the 35, 50, 85 are my kind of go-to primes. And then I still have a, I think it's down here. Um, I've got some other, yeah. So I've still got the older, um, 
EF version of that, uh, I think it's version 2, and I've got a macro lens, and I don't use a macro lens very much, so that's where I'm just going to leave the 100mm macro in the EF version and adapt it when I need it, because I don't, I don't often shoot with the, with the macro, I'm shooting more like people and type stuff. Um, and then, whoa, this was the other one, which is the, uh, the, the 3D lens, which I need to, need to get into, but need time to play around with it. It doesn't click in very intuitively. There we go. All right, so that's the lens lineup. Let's go back to the comments here. Let's go put this one away. Oh. All right. Um, yeah, Roto likes the glass for live streaming because it's super sharp. I've yeah, these lenses are are really sharp. I I've, I've been very happy with the sharpness, which I think is important when you're shooting 8K. And I do occasionally shoot 8K. I shot 8K for an interview this week where I'm finishing in 4K, um, so that is um, important. Um, question from Eric, which is EF to RF. Uh, what, what did Canon do that was radically better this time round? Um, what's better? I mean, EF and RF are, I would say, comparable on, on some levels. Like, I don't think it's night and day. Um, the EF lenses are still very good. I think because when they take out the mirror, it gives them a bit more space. And so it means that the, uh, for example, they can do things like with this, um, the 200 version where it's compacted down a bit more, I think. Um, or that could just be a different design in terms of a lens that, um, where are we? Let's go get this one off. A lens that barrel, like this one barrels out. So I've got locked. Out like that. Um, whereas the older lens sort of was that length and the barreling was happening internally. Um, so it's probably not necessarily a mount version. Um, but I think it, it's probably enabled them to get another f-stop out of some of their glasses. I don't know, I'm no expert on that. Um, and I think it, because it allows them to sit the, um, the lens mount closer to the sensor. So I think it helps. It just gives them a bit more latter, latitude in engineering from what I gather. A lot of caveats in there, not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, Roto's experience is that the RF is better control and functionality and you can expect better optical quality than the EF. The RF has 12 electric pins, four more than the eight pins on the EF lenses. Um, yeah, I think I, in terms of autofocus, I think they pair very well with the newer autofocus sen um, system and I, I think it's faster and more accurate. So those things are not always easy to um, trend. Like you can't see that immediately, but I think over time when you're looking at your shoots, you're like, yeah, it's, it is. And also with photography, a very good hit rate for the autofocus and the face tracking, the eye tracking. Um, that's really great for if I'm shooting portraits and I'm tracking someone's eye and it's in focus. Like the, someone walking towards the lens, like that is gonna track focus very quickly and will sort of keep them in focus. Whereas an EF lens might have like stepped it a bit more or um, had a bit more time getting there. Um, okay, jumping down through the comments here. Um, okay, uh, question, can you send me a rack? Already down up to my house with the ATEM Extreme ISO. I'm getting fed up with packing my gears into a 16, 15 flight case. It would be nice to just rock up to the gig and start. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why I built that um, rack video it was just because, uh, you know, having, having, I remember a couple of years back doing a shoot where I was like, oh, I'll plug it in when I get there. And it, just, it like takes hours. And then you're like, oh my God, I should be doing other things and like more creative tasks and, you know, speaking with the client more, that kind of stuff. So having a lot of your your power and your video and control like all those things set into a, a unit that you can when you take it onto location that's where my the rack that i have is kind of like the brain and so i plug it in switch it on and then it's really just connecting cameras and working out what sort of show you want to make um how good is a tascam audio interface on top of your 
camera. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, how have you found the focus wire feeling with the RF glass? I know you can switch it to linear mode, but I'm curious what the latency feels like. Um, I've, I've found it good, so you can, um, it's sort of responsive as you're probably aware. So if you, if you go quickly, it'll focus quickly. If you do it slowly, it'll focus slowly. So it's probably not so good for if you're putting a focus ring on it and you want to hit particular marks, but if you're doing it manually with your hand and you need to very like finely tune something, um, it's, it is much better there. The thing I found weird about the, uh, the 7200 is that it's kind of an inversion. So I'm always used to this wider part being the focus, um, but on the, this one it's the zoom. So that catches me out sometimes where I go to focus and I'm like, hang on a second, it's, it's here, this little one. Um, it's a little quirk. All right, next question. Aaron says, have you considered pairing the R5C with more of a cinema camera, even stripped down, or would a C70 or C300 be too big for you to travel when I see a big setup like this? Um, I seem like just running a C300. Yeah, I think that's a good point that um, once you once you rig all this stuff up for video, it's sort of, it's not that much bigger to have like a C300 or something like that. Like, you know, Canon R5C is this big, C300 is like, it is bigger, but um, you know, you got some of that stuff built in in terms of XLR. So um, I think for me, it was like partly like trying to consolidate a workflow as I was saying about having, like I, I shoot photos and I shoot video and it was kind of nice having everything there in those two bodies matching sensors for photos and for video. Um, I, I think I would down the line, if there was like an RF version of a C300, I might look at that. Um, I have a C200 that I'm gonna sell because I'm not using that anymore, um, but that used to be my sort of video go-to. Um, and then with the R5C, it was when I felt like I solved the audio and the video problems. I was like, okay, I can step away from the C200 and I can go to the uh, R5C as kind of like a, a primary system. Um, I've never liked the C70, just the form factor. I think it's because the body kind of feels like a 1D Mark X or whatever, like, like a bigger DSLR body. Um, and you can't separate the battery grip, like on the C200 or C300s, you can sort of rig it the way you want and you've got a hand grip that you can move. Um, and also the Super 35 sensor is, I mean, it's, it's a good sensor, but I think I've, I've just been more used to shooting full frame and I kind of like knowing when I'm doing an A cam and a B cam that like all the lenses are gonna, I don't have to like do a multiplication factor for it to sort of figure out what I'm gonna do. Um, so I kind of like that being the same. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, it's a good point that um, by the time you rig up all this kind of stuff, you are probably looking at something like a C300. Um, it, is, it is easier to travel with this though than some of the other bigger stuff because um, the lighter weight camera means that I can actually use a lighter weight tripod and some of that kind of stuff. So the surrounding gear also condenses down a bit and has made it possible to, to travel much more easily. Um, Martin says, when doing paid live streaming gigs, do you use these Canon mirrorless cameras in conjunction with the PTZs? And if yes, do they work well together? <clears throat> I really dry throat today. Oh man, <clears throat> give me a sec. Struggling through here. Um, <clears throat> it depends on the live streaming job. Um, the one I did for Amazon last year, we just, we rented five C300s and like ENG lenses and all that kind of stuff. And then I had the R5C on a gimbal to a Teradek. So that kind of became, that's how that was incorporated into that. Um, other sort of mid-level corporate live streams that I would do, I would use like two PTZ cameras. I might have the R5C on a, a wide shot. Maybe that's even like unmanned. Um, or I might have it on a gimbal. So yeah, I've sort of stayed within the Canon ecosystem in terms of sensors and colors. And I, I think that kind of works well with the PTZ cameras and the R5C. The, the main reservation I have about the R5C for live streaming is the, the micro HDMI. It's not, it's not ideal, 
Um, but for me, the pros of like uh, 8K video capture for my like brand and production work and the 45 megapixel sensor for photography was was really good. And then so, you know, so it depends on the job. Um, but yeah, good question. In dark environments, I've found the R5C to be good. The, the PTZ cameras um, are not so good in dark environments. They need a bit of light. That's why in this sort of studio I've got like uh, lights. Um, but yeah, I've been happy with the the uh, R5Cs and then obviously put a prime lens on it and um, you, you get a lot there too. 7200 is great. Um, I, that's one of the main reasons I bought that was just for the, the travel factor of it. It's not even the image quality. It's kind of that I don't have to like when you have to travel with this size lens, which is what the old version was. <clears throat> put it down here. Where are we? OK, so it's the old one and the new one. Um, this is version two of the EF and it's all so the the zooming is in the barrel and doesn't change. Um, there's some pros to that, but it meant that whenever I was packing it in my bag, I had to like lie it down. And I always found there was <clears throat> this much space in a bag that you're trying to like pack something soft on top of to sort of make use of the volume. And so it always felt like it took up more space in my bag than it otherwise warranted. And so I'll show you about there. Um, and so this one, which is the same size when it's extended, the fact that you can uh, get it down to that size means that I can actually stack it like this in my bag. And I'll, I'll show you in a bit of um, how I've uh, packed my bag. Um, yeah. Nice lenses. Yeah, I, uh, I'm happy with my ecosystem. You know, it was like, it's a bit of money to, to outlay and, uh, you know, Normally I would sort of do it over time, um, but there were certain Black Friday deals and credit card details uh, deals at um, B and H that I was able to get a bit cheaper. And I figured this is a, a ten-year investment, so that's where I would um, do that. All right, almost through these questions. Uh, Aaron is a video focused shooter, but having an internal ND on the C70 and FIMAC II is such a massive time saver. It's the re reason I decided to pass on the R5C. I think it's totally valid. Um, that was one of my main reservations too and um, it is something to think about like uh, putting a an ND on the front of I'll move these lenses around here on this you know like trying to screw on a filter here does take time and um, you gotta think about the type of production you're doing and if you have the type of time to do that. I managed to drop my filter this week when I was trying to like screw it on the front so it can be a bit finicky. Um, I think if you had the R5C with, if you've got like an extensive EF range of lenses and you were happy with them, like primes and zooms and that kind of stuff, and they were in good working order, I would almost say like stick with the EFs, get some adapters, and then you can have that, um, the EF to RF adapter with the drop-in filter. And that, that works well. But like I was saying, I uh, I was needing to get more like RF lenses and trying to straddle a bit of either side was difficult. And so I've just gone out with the EF and in with the RF. Um, but yeah, that's probably the main downside. One of the main downsides is the internal uh, ND and maybe something that, I don't know, an RF C300 might have, hopefully. I would consider that. And that's where I'm hoping like, you know, now that I've got some of these 85 primes and the 50 prime and all that, that that is, I feel like the word investment gets overused, but it's something that I can use for a long time. Aaron says the EF to RF biggest difference is the optical quality and the room for IS motors um, in a similar amount of space. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there's a lot less chromatic aberration that I've seen in comparison, smoother and AF too. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like all around the, the RF is just like a next sort of step up in um, clarity and um, speed of autofocus and that kind of stuff. So I think it's a, think it's a great point. Um, Aaron's seen rumors of C200 Mark II and looks interesting, but feels that Canon needs to offer more full frame sensor options and it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, like I said before, I, I think I would want to, if I got a video camera, like an actual video camera, I would want a full frame sensor partly just, just so my lenses are all the same and I'm not having to 
calculate like, oh, the 35 is more like a 50 on a crop sensor or whatever. Um, 45 megapixel full frame, hard to argue with. And Aaron says, this is just a discussion you guys are having online. Um, one thing I will say is that I love about the, uh, the C70 is that the battery lasts for ages, three hours and six hours on the 30 and 60 respectively. So while the grip is a little limited, it's pretty great. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think it's parfocal, but uh, there was a firmware update that came out recently, which I think might do that. Um, I saw an email about it, but I haven't got around to updating the uh, firmware in these guides, but I think there was some sort of firmware update for the Trinity that might make it parfocal. I'm not sure. It would be like a, an electronic um, adjustment, I think. All right, let's move along here. Uh, dual cinema camera bodies. Yeah, okay, so that's what I've got here. Um, so we're just going into a little bit more detail of uh, how I've rigged this. And you can see the, the differences here and then we'll pull them apart. So I need this shot here. Um, all right, so on my ACAM, this is where I can keep that screen around. Um, I feel like it's a little, hang on. Let me see if I can get a little more space here. Okay. Um, yes, can put on video is here. And it takes a second to boot up. Mm -hmm. There we go, that's how long it takes. Um, all right, so keeping the screen on the back easy for access has been my priority in terms of building this. I've got a small rig half cage. Um, and a, uh, actually I've got, so I bought a, a small rig full cage, which was the Black Mamba for the Canon R5C. And then when I got the second camera, I thought I'd try the half cage. And I would say my go-to cage is now actually the half cage, which is also compatible with the R5. Um, and the reason I like the half cage is, uh, I can leave it on, I leave it on more because I like just like the grip here of feeling, it's more like a photo grip that I'm used to. And then also on the bottom, the, the plate here, on the full version, it the, the metal kind of comes up so you can't slide a Arco plate in this side. Um, you can only slide it in from the other side. And where that becomes a problem is on a gimbal, if you're trying to get a gimbal, then it can only slide in from you know left to right and so otherwise you'd have to remove this plate um, but we'll get to that in a second um, so that's that's kind of why I've, I've gone with that but otherwise they're kind of matching cages it gives me um, is that right yeah there we go uh, it gives me somewhere to put the time code box up here time code box um, and then this hot shoe will um, go in here. So I've got just like a six inch power cable here going into USB-C and then I've got a tilter, um, I can unplug this and it will still run, uh, a tilter V-mount plate. And so I've actually put mine on the side. Um, and the reason I did that was the, I could put it on top, but then it's gonna get in the way of a top handle and I could put it on the back, but then it's gonna get in the way of the screen and I probably need, I need rails and it just becomes a lot bigger. Um, so putting this on the side meant that it was, it doesn't get in the way so much. Like I can, I just like I'll hold here and I'm like focusing, maybe gets in the way of the focus like a little bit, um, but here I'm like focusing like that. Um, the, the pro is that it gives me actually almost like a handle take to hold so I can now I've got like two grips on either side and that's worked well for just like lightweight stuff. Um, I've got a, a 50 watt battery here which keeps it nice and light. Um, otherwise over here I've got the, the 98 watt hour if I would just want more time if it's on a, on a tripod. Um, so this will let me come down here. Essentially this will, if I can pull this up here, uh, it's like a, taking off a flash, so you'd unscrew that and then just pull that off. And you can see under here there are some pins in the back, and here there's some pins 
in this Tascam thing that is sending the audio in a hot shoe straight into onto the file. So that's the advantage of the Tascam units. Um, let me see if I can play some audio though, because I, I had this problem with like, um, where are we? I don't know if this will play properly. Let's see. They took it in stride and when we received it back, it was better than I could have ever imagined. Um, which was really great and gave Hopefully me this is not being processed. I do have some filters on for the live stream. Really um, and, um, really want to make this sure is the 416 going built. directly into and the task it, cam. It was great. It turned out to be one of our I think there's a little bit of distortion uh, there. Create, creative assets on Instagram, which but is great for us. usable. Um, at the convention, it was a big hit as well. And so then we super, they this took is it in stride and when we the lapel, it back, it was which is going into Channel 2. And Channel 2, when I was doing the shoot, had like a lot of... Their work and... You know the fact that they really listen to it's our this brand. There's fuzz in it. It's kind of like really want to make sure that we're sticking. What to I'm what thinking is, and it, it was I feel like something in the the preamp in this uh, is kind of blown. Create, creative assets on Instagram, which is great for us. And it's putting this fuzz uh, into it. I was going. I, I changed the microphone. So we're super proud of that. It was having the, the same thing. Out. It's not the levels. The levels are set correctly. They weren't peaking. Um, so there's something about this unit that I don't trust 100. percent And on my next shoot, I actually used my. Um, my trusty, where is it? My Zoom H6, which I've had for many, many, many years uh, since that came out. And it's like, it's getting sticky now. It's kind of like all the, I don't know, the rubber's kind of peeling off it, but still sounds great. And it's very easy to just throw in the bag as a backup device. And so that's always been my like, just in case device. And I actually used it because this device, uh, I don't know, don't trust it. Don't trust it. So um, let me know what you think of that audio that I just played. Um, I feel like particularly this bit at the end is pretty obvious. The convention was a big hit as well. So we we're super proud of that and the way it turned out. Yeah, I feel like there is not great audio there. Um, so uh, we'll see, we'll follow up with that. I'm gonna follow up with Tascam, um, maybe send in for a pair. It's disappointing. What I would like to see is the, let me go to my desk shot here. So what I think would be awesome is a, a top handle that mounts to a frame and then you have an adapter, just like a little hot shoe wire that you would put in and you snap close and there's a wire that comes off. So you're not putting any pressure on the uh, hot shoe there. Um, see if I can get it right in here. Nope. Where are we going? Down here. There we go. Um, is that right in there? Getting into the shot. And yeah, so, sorry, that's just, that's a bad shot. It's gonna pull back. <laughs> so essentially it would be like a little audio box, like smaller than this, that would, um, bolt onto a top handle so you could put it somewhere or you could even put it on the back if you don't want it on a top handle so you could actually, so I think there should be like mounting points on this that make it easy to mount to a top handle or to the side or the back uh, with two XLR inputs and then an extension cable that would come from this to the hot shoe that would just snap in. Um, and then uh, the the actual cage would take all the weight and the, the moving around. And so it, I, I think that would be much better design and I hope someone makes that. Um, the other thing that I think would be really neat is Canon could make a battery grip. <clears throat> this would solve a lot of problems. So imagine Canon makes a battery grip um, that has, you know, can take a bigger battery. I guess we're getting into sort of um, C70 territory here. That would have a bigger battery in there or something that can be plugged into it. You could have two XLRs coming out of this side of it. Um, I think that would sort of solve a lot of problems and it'd be really nice to adapt to it. Um, cool. <clears throat> um, Aaron says, yes, there is a strange buzz. Have you double checked the cables? Almost sounds like interference. Sony's version of the top audio interface model used to ship with an extension cable for offsetting it. I uh, haven't used Sony's one, but the, the, what I've seen of it, it looks great. Um, and I wish they had that one. Um, 
I did, so I was using a wireless microphone and I thought, you know, just, so we changed out the microphone and I used a wired one to replace it and that was still there. So I think it's, from what I can gather, it's, it's not, it wasn't my headphones, obviously, because it's in there. Um, and I think it's something in the Tascam device. And I've had a friend of mine who had her device blow and they replaced it. So I'm wondering if it's, there's something about, I don't know, maybe if like phantom power's on and it gets, something gets plugged in and there's no nothing that's gonna sort of limit that and it blows something in a uh, preamp, or, I don't know. Um, but doesn't feel reliable. And uh, I'm not gonna trust it anymore. So, yeah. Okay, what's next? Um, the, okay, so that's my, that's my half cage setup with that one. And then this would go to the full cage setup um, I've got a, like a, this one I used to use on the C200 and just a hot, uh, what do you call that? Cold shoe to a uh, field world monitor here, which is an ultra bright. So um, that has, uh, doesn't need a hood in the daylight using the HDMI in on a two foot small rig cable. And then the power is actually coming off <coughs> um, a V-mount, <coughs> excuse me, uh, D-tap here for the monitor and the USB-C coming out of the battery itself into the camera. Um, and then on the back, I've got this uh, Pro Media Gear PM51L. I love these plates because they, um, or 501, I guess, these are basically 501 Manfrotto tripod plates. And then on the other way is uh, an Arca Swiss plate. And so it means like very low profile. I can actually mount that onto the tripod without having to put like a like a bigger, base on it and um, so I can actually just like put that in the bag and it makes it easy to travel with. Um, same thing with the time code and the battery there and then the lens. All right, let me put that one over there. Okay, moving along. What are we up to? Okay, battery. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned that. Uh, you've seen these FX Lion batteries before. Um, I do recommend them. I think they are great. Getting a, a small one is good for simple run and gun type stuff. And then um, getting these bigger ones is good for just like having like a really long, long run. All right, audio, I covered that too. We talked about the Tascam. Um, what else is there to talk about? I think I've covered it with the audio. I think what I'm possibly gonna go back to is probably getting something like a sound devices uh, unit and just going back to time code separately, uh, because I've got these time code devices, it, um, it's not a difficult lift in post when you bring them in, it all syncs up. So that's probably like the best and most reliable way to go. Um, gimbal, all right, so uh, we've got DJI RS2 here. Yeah. So when I've, so I've taken off the audio thing, right? So this is moving from an interview setup where I'm, I'm got the task cam if it works, take that off. Um, I would probably take off the, yeah, take off the battery as well. Um, and then on the gimbal, I just release this. I think this is mostly balanced. The, the nice thing about this plate, as I was saying with the half cage, oh, okay, so this is the tripod plate here, and then that slides off. And then this just slides on to here, and it actually goes exactly the right length in terms of sitting in the middle. And I would um, lock that down here. <coughs> and this is not balanced. This is way overbalanced. I must have moved in the case. Okay, I'm not gonna balance this perfectly, but essentially, um, if, I, if I had pre-balanced it, then it would, it would work. Um, so, there we go. Okay, that's, that's good enough. Um, then for powering, I have been using, I have this like Zite converter, which will take um, the RS2 power of a USB and put it into a dummy battery. Um, I've had one or two times where, uh, actually I had it on this shoot, it locked up. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop using this one because it hadn't finished recording. So the file was, wasn't corrupted, but like it needed restoring and then the file was fine. Um, so I think Canon's done a good job of like being able to restore files that 
if the power is cut, then um, you can save the recording up to that point so you don't actually lose a file. Um, but not an ideal way to work, so I think I'm going to ditch this one. The advantage of this was it meant that I could put a dummy battery in, and then in terms of weight, I'm really just running off... Um, you know, this is as light as I can get a gimbal, which if you're using it for eight hours is important, uh, because you can do a lot of damage if you're using one hand for the whole day. Um, definitely need... I've got the handles, but then it becomes like a bigger rig. Um, so what I've also got is this Indie Pro dummy battery. So it's a D-tap to uh, regulated uh, dummy battery. And this one will go, so I can take a, you know, get like a, I'll get like a little one. Okay, so then there's a small rig NATO and V-clamp here. So this is a tiny little, tiny little piece here. Let me just move this around, if I can show you a shot. Um, so there's a, a V-rig, sorry, a, a small rig V-mount micro clamp on this side attached to a NATO clamp here. So that is attaching to the side of the gimbal. And it just gives me um, the, where are we? Not in the light, that will uh, lock into it. So back to this shot here. So this will go on the side, I'll lock it down, and then the battery will sit on the side. I'm going to push this in, and then, and then, that's where I'd put in the D-tap. And to do this, I'd have to take off the camera, and so I'd take out the default battery, put this one in. Close that one down, <clears throat> and then that will slide on. Where are we? Like that. And you might have to rebalance it a bit. And so I've got this cable hanging there, but that's generally fine. Um, and then and I can put like a bigger battery on here, and again, so I can run a gimbal the whole day with really not much extra weight um, than that. And so that works really well for some instances. And uh, Otherwise, I would build it out with arms and stuff, but that becomes a lot more weight, and then I'm probably getting an assistant to kind of, or like a camera operator, run that um, rather than doing it on my own. Um, so that is the that's the gimbal. Um, all right, questions here. Eric can notice the audio. That's good. Um, H6 to the rescue. The Tascam has the same design. Yeah, I wish I wish Canon came out with something for the R5C. Um, and Aaron says that Tas Tascam's products have failed him in the past. The DR60 was trash. I don't think I've really used Tascam much. It's often been Zoom or sound devices or... Yeah, um, that's the only product that was available for that hot shoe, um, which is... I wish there was something else on the market. Okay, that is the gimbal. Let's move this one over here. And what do we got next? Travel. Okay, so the, the thing with this is you want to get all of this into a, onto an airplane, right? All these lenses and all that. So what I have is, let's take a look at, whew, swing around here, um, is my, my travel cases. So I have the... <laughs> Can I get my camera on here? Um, I have the... Uh, I'm just going to like turn off this one. Let's just kill this and I'll just go onto this camera. Um, g'day. Uh, so I've got my, my two Pelicans. Uh, this one take, takes more like audio and I've got my drone, GoPro. Uh, I had my clothes in here because I didn't have enough space in there for a separate bag. And this has all sorts of like camera connection parts. Um, I've got like the microphone, that's the 4 and 6 shotgun mic, which I normally use on this live stream, but today it's hooked up here. Uh, this is all a bit of a mess. Um, and then this one is uh, Aperture's 60Xs. And again, I'm, I'm normally uh, have these hooked up here and having backlights and stuff, so I have no, no hair light today. Um, but in the Pelican, I can fit a tripod and I've got my, my boom, 
Um, so I've got a boom that's small enough to fit in there with the audio inside of it and some Matthews reverse stands that are fairly lightweight and have these nice stops so everything's pretty solid. And then down here I had um, cables and the iDirect kind of packs down into here that we had before it was um, all fitting into there. Moving over to um, over here, this is where I had my all my lenses would go in here. Um, and as I was saying before, they can stack in here pretty well because of uh, like this C2, this uh, 20, 70 to 200 actually fits vertically in there. So that's where they all live now. And, and then I'm gonna get caught up in a cable here. Uh, let's go to, make sure we're going in here. I'm gonna get rid of my key again. Um, Got to rotate around because I'm getting caught up in my cable. <laughs> and so then when I would go to a photography shoot, this is where I could move from this uh, spinner bag. No, it's not. It's not like a super. Good day. Um, it's it's not a it's not a super big bag. But what I like about it is it makes. I, I know it's definitely going to fit on the airplane overhead, and so I can't overpack it. And so I've never had my bag taken off me, which you don't want when this is filled with, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of photography gear. Um, so that's kind of my, my travel case as a Manfrotto spinner thing. And then this bag is my low pro something or other. I don't know what it's called, but I've, I've had this since I had that old lens. So I've had this since like 2009. Um, it's been all around the world with me multiple times and I've taken this to Bali and India and all sorts of places, um, but this is kind of my go-to photography bag now. So I've actually uh, fit a um, a flash in here. I think we can see this, yeah. So I can fit um, flash in there. I'll put my my camera will go in here and um, extra batteries, the transmitter. Um, what else we got? Some gaff tape, some filters, photo strap, and then. Um, some backup flashes. So I always take like a backup flash just in case something happens. And then the, this cable. All right, let's go back to here. And we can move on to last section, almost there. Um, we're gonna talk about photography. This is a Tether Tools cable, which is 15 feet, I think, USB-C. And so I will use this for my photo work. So I'm going to show you um, why I have an R5C, which is when I'm not shooting video and I don't need all of this stuff, pop this one out, then I can get rid of the gimbal and uh, what else can I do? I can take off the time code and so we're down to like, this is sort of basic um, cage here with that battery mount that's still attached. And then I would um, undo the bottom of it. So under here, we would get the, there's a little screw that sits in here. And so I can actually unscrew this cage like that. Excellent. And then, uh, go around like this. So, and then you actually, to take this off, you, you're doing this separated. So I'd have to actually take off the lens and then the body will just peel away. Now the, the cage does come with a, a little screw in bit here. If you want to stabilize the cage on this corner here, I've actually taken to not using it because most of the weight is sort of taken by the cage anyway and the camera's not, like I don't have like massive lenses on it. Um, so I've been okay not using it and just means that I've been able to take this off um, and on at will, it's very easy. And then I can pop this one, this little screw back in there. And then you got your little mini half cage, get rid of that. Um, and then this is feeling already so much better. This is like, this makes me feel happy, which is like when you've got, a little camera and you can just like walk around the streets and take some photos like I did in Atlanta and 
just kind of find some interesting places and light and angles and that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so let's pop on 85. Where did that go? 85. And I need to get this thing. Where is it? All right. So when I shoot photos, I'm shooting, uh, well, it depends on the job. Um, when I'm shooting headshots, I should say, I am shooting to a computer so we can review that on the spot in Capture One. And um, that is where having this cable is good because it is high vis and so no one trips over it. I will put this end into the computer. It's just USB-C to USB-C, but it's nice and thick. And I will actually like tape this to the desk so that it can't you know, yank out and pull it across the room. And then the other end, this is where um, I'm going to in here. So this would come up and this piece comes with Canon. You're probably familiar with this if you bought a Canon camera. Um, this screws in here. It's a cable holder. And then I've pre-fed this one through. So this goes like, uh, this goes in here and this one goes in the top there. So that'll click in there and that's clicked in and then that is now connected USB-C and so it's nice and solid so I can't um, pull that out. And then I can connect a, let's say like the 85, we can get that. Turn it off. And we can get the, yeah, I can see like the 85 is like, the glass is like right out there. Um, all right. And so then we have 85 photo lens connected to the computer. And that's the way I would sort of shoot in my, um, for my photography. And so, oh, oh, the other thing was I didn't mention was the battery grip. Um, so the other thing about having the R5C is that you can put a battery grip on it, which is great for vertical because it means I can hold it like this. Um, so this is where I would, uh, let's cut over here again. Um, this opens up, this unclicks, and then under here, this clicks into the side of this like that. And then this actually goes right in here. And then that screws down like that. Cool. And then we've got the, uh, like a, you know, a full size body for shooting photos that I can uh, have a vertical grip like that, which has a shutter button there as well as a shutter button there for horizontal. So that's my photo um, setup. And I've only got one battery grip for that because I'm usually only shooting with one camera for that. Um, if I was needing two cameras, the other one would just have like the, without the grip. Um, yeah. Uh, a spiral, spiral out preset on the overhead PTZ camera. Eric likes that. Yeah, I was, so before the show, I was like, oh, I gotta, because everything's still there, I haven't packed it away. And so I was like, I need to like find a preset to sort of show you what goes into, into the camera bags. Um, and that was, that's how we pulled that up. Um, okay. Brian says he's blown, blown two preamps on two different Canon XLR modules for the C300 Mark II, amongst other cameras. Plugging in a battery powered shotgun while Phantom was on, not a good combo. Yeah, I know it's not a good combo. I feel like it just like, there's times when it happens or, uh, battery powered shotgun. Yeah, probably not a battery powered shotgun, you don't want that. But like, I'm not sure if the best protocol is like, if you got Phantom power on, you shouldn't disconnect a shotgun mic or not. Um, I feel like it's got to happen a lot. And I've never had that problem in any other audio products. So I'm thinking there's not enough safety built into that device. If you know, you're unplugging a, like, you know, if I'm going to unplug this wireless device, do I need to power it off? And I can't power it off because I would have to disconnect it because when it's connected to the camera, it's automatically on, which would mean to unplug a microphone, I would need to shut down the entire camera. And it's, that's, not a, that's not a workflow. Um, 
Yeah. And Eric says, R5C, it's so small when you derig it. Yeah, it is uh, It is amazing. I, I think the, what I wasn't sure before I bought it was, and if you're worried about this, I don't think it is a problem, um, was the fan on the back. Obviously the R5 is, is even more compact and it's really nice and little. And when I was looking at the R5C, it's got this fan, right? So the R5 would be this body and then the R5C sticks out this much. Um, but it hasn't been a problem for me because it doesn't interfere with your, your grip. Like it's still the same grip there. And I don't have any problems on this side because I can access everything. Um, the advantage of the extra sticking out is that this screen actually pops out and I can rotate it without it getting in the way of these cables. Um, it may be like a little impeded by this uh, cable clamp here, but otherwise it's, um, yeah, it means that I can actually flip it out and turn it and flip it back in like that. And what else? Oh, I mean, just, I mean, the time code's great, but obviously just like the fact that you can run this 24 seven, like a video camera and you don't have to worry about overheating um, is a kind of non-starter for, for that. I put some caps on my lenses. Um, any other questions before we uh, get out of here? Let me know. Um, I know we've gone a bit over an hour here. One hour twenty. Wow, we're still still chatting about cameras. There's a lot to chat about. I kind of showed you the whole the whole setup. Other than, um, so these are all my my main cameras that I'm shooting my productions on, and then I got my two Canon PTZ cameras that I'm doing the live streaming with, and then I got two GoPros and. A really old Mavic, um, that's, which we'll probably update at some point. Um, yeah, Eric says, don't forget to number one, like, and number two, subscribe. I appreciate that. Um, I was like, at the end of last year, I was like, I was like, maybe we can hit 5,000 before the end of the year. And uh, I didn't get there. I'm sort of growing slowly, slowly growing. But the point is we are growing a little step every day. Um, so yeah, it's really, Really great to have you guys on here and um, tuning into the channel each week. Um, thanks for being um, consistent viewers. I am going to try and I'm going to try and be consistent. I got a couple of big things happening this year, um, personally in my life. So I, I I'm going to try and be consistent and uh, as much as I can. Um, I'm going to moving forward. Going to be scheduling is for Fridays at 10 a.m. Um, I just feel like that's sort of a gives me a bit of time in the week to get prepped and then to go live and, and sort of do the show at a time zone that I think is probably the best for most of the world from like Pacific Coast to Europe, Asia. And then my home country kind of misses out. Australia is definitely asleep at that time, other than Roto. So I appreciate Roto, you um, being there. Martin says, do you have specific cases for them? I think it means the PTZ cameras. I don't, they, one of the things I think Canon should do with the PTZ cameras is they should ship it with a little lens cap. They don't actually ship the PTZ camera with any, anything. It's a PTZ camera in a box. The only thing they give you is, give me a second, if I can get into my box over here. The only thing you get with a PTZ camera is this bit of foam. Um, and that, if the, the camera is like this, you know, so it's sort of going around and up and around. Um, this foam kind of wedges in there to keep the lens locked, not locked, but just kind of stabilized, you know, so it's it's not rolling around. Um, that's just really, there's literally a piece of foam. Uh, it's probably just packaging that was included in the initial packaging. Maybe because PTZ cameras are generally installed, they think it doesn't need that because it's maybe just going to be permanently sitting, you know, on a wall or in a ceiling or something like that. Um, but it would be really great if Canon <clears throat> had more of a travel solution because I, I think this is something that, I mean, I've been using on, on different jobs and it means that you've got to take a camera to a location. And um, yeah, so I actually just put it in my, um, I'm gonna swing around to this, this floor pelican case again. Oh, there we go. Um, I actually just, I'll usually put it in this bag here and I'll like where this GoPro is, it'll fit in there. Sorry, my drone, that's my Mavic. Um, one will fit there, the one next to it, and then, you know, other stuff in the case. So 
Um, that's generally how I will sort of have the bag laid out, and, and it's been fine because um, I've I've tried to um, come back here as much as possible. I like the Pelican cases because you can get a whole bunch of stuff in there, and I think taking like two big bags to shoot is much better than seven different little bags that are falling off each other and rolling around. So it's easier to easier to manage. Um, yeah, Eric says so so close to five k. We'll get there at some point. It's it's uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I would love to make more videos and put them out on the channel. It's just a matter of time. Um, with everything else going on in life, um, but um, it's been really great to, you know, have you guys here every week. Um, cool. Let me see. I think that's probably about it. If you got any other questions um, post show, drop them in the comments of of this particular video, and we can take a look at that. And I can answer those questions for you. But hopefully that gave you a good overview of using um, photos and video. Um, I'm not sure what that, that's my gimbal in the background there. I was like, I thought Eric had some green screen there. Um, yeah, I've, I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm enjoying the prime lenses, I think. It, it's been really nice just getting some, some solid primes into my workflow. Um, I still use the, the Holy Trinity a lot because it, it's, it's just so versatile and fast and you don't always need like a you know, massive aperture. Um, sometimes you don't want that. You want to be able to see like New York City in the background rather than it being blurred out. So, um, but yeah, lens have been great. And for me, this is really like a long-term solution. You know, I'm, when I buy a 85 mil prime lens, I'm thinking 10 years from now, um, I'm probably gonna have that same lens and I'm gonna be using it on different photo and video jobs. And so for me, um, for me, that's been worth it. Um, but yeah. Thanks for tuning in today and um, I will see you, I'll see you next week. I'm going to put a, a placeholder up for next week. So we'll go live 10 a.m. Eastern on Fridays. Make sure you tune in for that. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care.